In this tutorial, we're going to explore uh, the novel An Open Swimmer by Tim Winton, and we're going to look at how he um, shapes the beginning of his uh, novel, you know, the narrative that he's telling using a range of stylistic devices with the intent that we can pick up a few um, uh, ideas and strategies that then we're able to use in our own writing. Um, the novel is called An Open Swimmer, and um, you'll see in a second that it's um, to do with a fish. And it's really interesting, isn't it, the title, because, you know, there are um, connotations that come with this notion of an open swimmer. And if you think about it, um, you know, there is this notion of freedom um, that, that comes um, with the, the relevance of of this title and, and so we'll see how that ties into the uh, the telling of the story and um, you know the image there gives us a bit of an, in, in, an invitation into the story and tells us a little bit about what it's going to be about okay if we begin with the opening sentence it had been a long fight between Jer and Islam and the fish um, once again we've got a really um, interesting opening sentence that is a bit enigmatic. Um, there are things that we're not really sure about. We don't know um, where the fight's occurring um, and, you know, we have no context of that. And what that does, it invites the reader into the narrative. Um, the other thing that I've put up here is that there is a, a literary tradition of stories about individuals um, having epic battles with fish. And one of them um, which is, uh, you know, um, a, a, a really famous story is The Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. And, and so it is, um, you know, um, not only inviting us into the narrative through its um, enigmatic qualities, but it's also um, drawing on our uh, cultural and literary traditions um, to do with, with um, fish. The, the 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 fighting or the capture and catching of fish. Um, you'll notice at the start here there are a number of short sentences. His father grinned in the stern. The engine was chuckling. Water parted like an incision behind. The fish grunted. So um, you know, it, rather than giving us long drawn out um, sentences that are very descriptive and give us all that detail, we find that. That, um, that the short sentences are enough to give us that. We know what the father's attitude is as a result of watching his child um, have this experience, and maybe it's a coming-of-age moment. The engine was chuckling, so it's personified here, um, which tells us um, that, that the whole, you know, it's meant to reflect the, the, the positive, happy nature of the, um, the experience from the pa father's perspective. Um, then the next sentence, the water parted like an incision behind. So it gives us this really nice um, visual image of, of the lines being drawn as the boat um, sort of slices through the water. Um, so it's really, the simile is creating a really strong visual image. Um, and it complements all the visual imagery that, that is um, evident in the, the piece of writing. Okay, so we've got lots of um, little things, little simple things going on that um, lead and, and provide us with a lot of um, uh, deeper, deeper information, deeper meaning we can draw into it. Okay, we'll come back to this idea of incisions um, behind. Um, now, if we come down further, you know, we, um, you know, the, the story unfolds a bit and Jera's palms were bleeding and he wanted to cry. So here the author is starting to just reveal the, the inner thoughts of the character and we can see that, that, um, um, that he's had this long battle and we think there's a coming of age sort of moment happening. Um, and then there are little clues in here um, that that looking up at him, the eye never blinked. So it's like the um, the the eye, the fish is staring into Jera's soul, and and down here, um, with, he's talking about the second fish that's in the water, and he says the diamond had gone. So what um, Tim Winton's doing is he's really um, he's really um, making this um, sort of um, feeling of um, um, guilt 
and um, you know there's a strong emotional connection between Jera and the fish. Maybe this is his first um, time where he's killed or caught and killed a fish, and this is the the response that that has occurred. And they talk about eyes being a window to the soul, and you know we know that these fish would have very big eyes. Um, and, and so that's a really clever way for the author to, to reveal a lot about how the character's feeling without actually directly telling the reader. Okay, and um, down here, I don't want to cut him up, Dad, um, you know, which really um, just builds that, that um, characterization really well. Now, what I've done as well is I've highlighted a whole lot of words in pink, and we've got incision, and we've got diamond, silver, scalpel, the scalpel of the dorsal fin. Look, that's a nice, you know, the, the diamond curved and straightened, blemishing the surface with its scalpel of a dorsal fin. So um, this is the, the other fish, the partner fish that's still in the water. And, um, you know, and and its dorsal fin is, becomes a scalpel that, that is neatly um, slicing through the water, just like the, the boat's incision. Okay, so we've got these words scalpel, incision, and we've got cut as well um, just below. So there's, there's um, those sort of words occurring. And then we've got diamond and silver and glistening. So we've got a couple um, of things occurring there. And they are what's called a lexical chain. And a lexical chain is when you there are uh, words in the story that... that um, you know, work together to, to build an impression. So I think that what these words are doing is that they're, they're setting up this idea of there being a, a binary um, force. You know, in lots of stories there, there's, um, there are binary forces like good and evil and life and death um, that are competing for the narrative. And, um, and so I think in this story we're, we're seeing that that um, that's what Jera is really struggling with, that that um, he has killed this fish and it's a beautiful creature. And so there is this um, fine balance and, you know, there, there is, a, you know, a fine line between um, life and death and um, he's he's coming to terms with it, that um, and that maybe that's, a, a, you know, a sign of him entering adulthood, you know, that he's really conscious of what's going on. So... The lexical, lexical chains generally happen um, coincidentally, I think, when we write. But when you go back through editing, you could see that, that um, there'd be ways to just include a few extra words that, that are going to, you know, replace a word with another word so that you do get this um, sort of travelling of, of um, you know, um, words that create that image. Then, so that was the prologue, the start of the novel, and um, then we move into the the the, um, the the novel for real, so the first chapter. Uh, and um, what I think we could start by saying is, because this is a novel and it's you know a couple hundred pages long, um, novels have the luxury of being able to use a lot of dialogue, and so you'll see just in these um, sections here on the, this page, there is a lot of dialogue. And for our purposes, writing a narrative, that's way too much. I think if you used about this much, that would be fine. Um, but um, there is a tendency when you start using dialogue in a short story, like in a narrative, that, that it takes control. And what it does is it really limits your opportunity to use other features of language. And that's problematic. So... Um, my recommendation to you would be just to to keep keep your dialogue to a um, to a real minimum. Okay, let's look at this opening sentence. Away to their left, a flight of cockatoos lifted from the gums and swung in a pink cloud over the road and into the bush. That's a really nice sentence. I think it's it's um it's it's an interesting um, start to the the sentence as well. Away to their left. It's actually a complex sentence because really we could have the sentence a flight of cockatoos lifted from the gums and swung into a pink cloud. There's your, there's your sentence. 
but we've got this extra idea, the um, the uh, dependent clause that that adds that further meaning. Meaning, but it's it's just a, a nice, um, interesting way of um, um, creating a setting and and doing it in a way that that is uh, just a bit less than ordinary. Now, um, there's lots of imagery, um, you know, it's appealing to um, our sense of sight and it's quite vivid. You know, we've got these um, pink cloud of cockatoos um, that are flying over the road into the bush, which which um, creates a nice image. Um, but I like the word, the verbs that have been used. The flight of cockatoos lifted from the gums. So they've, as a whole group, they've gone um, together and um, they're not you know it's like they're all one one body and they're autonomous um and they swung in a pink cloud so they didn't just fly in a pink cloud but just by looking at um the verbs you use you can really create a real impact and um so i think that that's um something that would would um be very helpful to you and it, it, i mean they they tell us about the the movement of the birds, you know, that that um, that rather than squawking and flying and being chaotic, it's done in a more graceful way. And I meant to say that about the fish, that you know, the open swimmer, um, a sense of um, provides an idea of a sense of freedom, and um, really that these fish are very graceful and beautiful creatures, and I suppose that extends to these birds as well. Okay, petrol, Sean asks. Enough if we find something soon. Bloody tourist maps. Not far. Roads heading for the coast. Jared glanced at Sean, whose pale curls bobbed in the breeze from the open window. He flicked on the beams, lighting up the loose surface ahead. The road was sloping away, curving, unknotting itself. He saw the thick red tail of gravel dust lifting in the mirror. So this is a nice observation from the, from the narrator. And, um, you know, it, it creates a very clear picture of the, the setting. And, um, you know, it's really nice sort of image used there looking into the rear vision mirror. And, um, you know, we've got a very strong sense of what, what the scene looked like. And I really like this um, notion that I suppose it's like the road is personified, that the road is unknotting itself. So it's it's um, moving from being a twisty turny road and becoming straight. So it, it's a very nice um, means of visual um, description. The headlights caught the eyes of animals and held them in the th by the throat, rigid until they passed. So it's showing the impact you know that these strong lights are having, um, and it's illuminating the all the the um, wildlife and the landscape around it. A roof floated across bashing off into the undergrowth. So once again, those verbs um, are carefully chosen and they carry a lot of impact, I think. Okay, if we go up the top here, um, I've just... That's for the look on your face in the morning. Already he smelt the crushed insects and the flaky wood under ghost gums. So there it's telling the reader, isn't it? He's telling us what it smelt like but it is appealing to our sense of smell so um you know um the sensory imagery is a really good thing to use in in your writing then we get down here and they're talking about um further down swelling out of the carved off bank of the track was a grizzled she oak with the letters no paired neatly out of the bark so that's a really interesting way to describe how the letters N and O had been carved into the into the tree, and that word paired or the two words together really tell us a lot about um, a, you know they provide a lot they they encourage us to think um, you know why have they been paired neatly who's done this what does it tell us about the um the person who's done this and I I'm imagining it's because someone has uh, feels really emotional about something they they you know like it, it's revealing before we even meet the character who's um, carved these letters into the tree it's telling us that they're either desperate or they're really um, 
uh, upset or something like that. So it's it's providing us with with um, the ability to start speculating on things before we even um, meet the character. And it's certainly enigmatic. We want to know more. So that's a nice thing to do too. Have the, have the reader trying to piece things together and then maybe um, in the next paragraph or the one after that, there'll be another little reveal which will will build on that first one. And then it says that the, the, they paired it neatly out of the bark the O bleeding vicious sap from the white flesh. So the talking about the flesh of the, the tree, but it, it is really sort of metaphoric for the suffering of an individual. So the tree is really being uh, compared to a person. Um, and it, it's all about suffering, isn't it? And so when you put these two things together, you start to feel that, that the character who's done this is... Um, in a in a moment of personal trauma or um, is suffering in some way, um, a clearing they rattled into the grove. Okay, so that the having the the car rattle along um, really um, one word adds all that sound and movement and you know most of us have have had that experience in a in a an old car that sort of shakes. Um, uncontrollably when it's going down a dirt road. Um, so it, it allows us to uh, understand um, the experience a little bit more. And we've got some more short sentences. Sean dropped a mallee root onto the fire. Gerald rolled the pan. He flipped the stuff onto the plate. So here it's just um, going through the, the motions of um, them cooking dinner. Um, and it doesn't, at this point, the, the author's chosen not to go into too much detail. They're just, they're eating their fried e eggs and talking around the food in their mouths. At the end, though, um, just before bed, um, the smell of smoke in his clothes made Jera feel he had been there forever. So, a couple things there. Firstly, um, what the narrator is doing is, is um, allowing us to... Um, gain an insight into Jera's thoughts and feelings. And there's been little reveals of this. Um, so sometimes um, when you're writing a story, you'll do that in first person. But in this case, um, it's written in third person and the narrator is omniscient. And that means that the narrator is all knowing. So the narrator has uh, a clear understanding of what the character thinks and feels and they reveal it that way. Okay, so it's a nice little way to finish the page. Um, and and there could be a couple of reasons why Jera feels like he's been there forever. Maybe this is a comfortable place that he's been to many times um, and, and he has a sense of belonging there. Uh, maybe it's the smell of the smoke that, that um, you know, really connects him. Um, and there's been a lot of visual um, and... Um, you know, a um, little bit of sound imagery and a, and a bit of um, um, olfactory imagery, the imagery of s the sense of smell um, throughout the piece, and, and they all sort of build together. So these are all good things that, that we can take um, and, and develop into our own writing. And um, if we were to read more, we might find out a bit more about um, the connection of the fish that the... The fish um, are partners, and that that um, that their connection is is really strong, and then that might be a motif for um, the character looking for connection in their lives. Anyway, um, from here, the it would be good to think about one or two of the um, devices that the writer has used, and see if you can um, consciously develop that in your process of writing your own creative pieces.